Hey, Blockheads. This is Kevin Morin. I'm the head of Mark Setbot. We make autonomous race marks for sailboat racing. So I'm a lightning sailor and the club I was at when I was younger has depth problems. And so there are a couple of stories that tie into this, but there's a part of the lake where when the wind blows from that direction, it should be the best sailing, but you can't set marks in that part of the lake because it's too deep. And so early on when we were at the club, we would constantly have this pain around hey, this should be a great race day, and it's not because of that depth thing. So a while back, it's probably about seven years ago, we started talking about how we could fix that, and then the, the process be began from there. So we had the pain, and then we decided we were going to do something about it. In terms of the process, how you get to making a prototype, we use the same kind of technique in everything we make. The first progression was, can we get something to float properly, to thrust properly? The GPS stuff was secondary, right? We needed to make a stable platform. So we started with a very small version that was about 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, just to keep it low cost, right? As we were prototyping the different code and we learned a lot from that and then very rapidly scaled up because we had learned, we felt like we had learned what we needed to learn. And so then it was very iterative, one increment after another, improving as we tested each part of it until we got it just right. So in terms of propelling the bots around, we felt like there were a couple scenarios we needed to work inside. One was just to be able to hold position somewhere, and the other was to be able to navigate from one place to another both so that you could leave your club and get to the race course and so that when the race course changed you could with the tap of a button make it go somewhere else so we started looking for propulsion systems and we originally used some that would be you know, kind of robotics propulsion systems that serve multiple purposes and you'd, you'd pick them up and you'd add them in the challenge with that was it became very clear early on that this was going to be an international an international thing and we needed supportability. So something like a motor or an engine inherently wears out. The ones we picked run for a really long time, but inherently it's a moving part and it'll need to be replaced. So we, what we did was we found vendors that worked throughout the whole world already, such that if somebody needed to service one of our motors, they could do that without shipping it back to the United States. You have a cell phone or a tablet that you control the bots with, and it's designed in its simplest form for you to be on the race committee signal boat. And you say what direction you want the course to be, and then you tell the mark set bots to go to that specific heading. It can control in the interface up to seven bots. And so if you think of a full race course, you've got your start, you've got a finish mark, you've got lured gates, you have a windward mark and an offset. And so we can control up to seven with the app. So one of the ways we innovate is by partnering up whenever possible with people who are better at stuff than we are. And so a huge amount of the mark set bot is integrating different pieces of technology. And so the web development and the communication systems, we do that in-house, the manufacturing we do in-house, but there are certain things. We don't make the motherboards. We work with a partner who makes them for us. We don't make the rubber parts. We work with a company that only makes rubber parts. And so you leverage, at least we do, in these kinds of projects, you leverage the people who are best at stuff. And then the, the magic is when you pull it all together. But that moment at which you just look and say, holy cow, it works. And I remember that exact moment we were doing a regatta in Detroit 
and it was at our club. And so it wasn't hard to convince the club to let us use it. And we put it out there and it was a very primitive version, but it could hold place and it could move the upwind mark could move left and right to adjust the course. And every single person came up to me afterwards and said, Kevin, I thought this was a bad idea, but now I'm convinced. Right. So that's just the perfect, perfect summary of how a, an innovation works when it's that new that you have people who don't believe that it could work and then they see it firsthand and they become believers. There are kind of two philosophies on how development projects happen. The more traditional approach is you design it and you design it and you design it and you design it and then you make it. And the approach we take is to make it and find out what is wrong as quickly as possible and get the product out there. And so most of the time you're able to get a product into people's hands substantially faster by doing it the way we do it. And then you learn what you need to learn along the way. So you rapidly figure out what you think is going to go wrong and you try to prevent it. And then the world uses your stuff in a way that you didn't anticipate. And so then you make it bulletproof in that scenario too. I think early on one that tells a good story of finding a problem once it got out in the world, the cellular area. So it's a cellular based system. And in most of the areas we sail, the cellular is good enough. It doesn't need to be high output. It just needs to be good enough. When we get, we've gotten into some places in the mountains in Europe where maybe the connection drops once a second and then it's up for a second and down for a second. And so the original code wasn't designed to do that, right? Let's say the code took us 50 hours to make for the communication module. We could have spent 300 hours and made it bulletproof, but we spent 50 hours and then got it out there and then learned about the problems along the way. And so we then had to make it, it was a, the sale GP event in Marseille was one of the ones where we had just terrible cellular problems until we figured out how to handle it. And so it was just tweaking the code to handle those kind of unique situations. Sure. I think it's important to talk about the first one that was a real success. And so Yacht Club de Monaco reached out early on. We had just finished the beta and they were interested in getting autonomous marks. What I didn't realize, so I was used to needing marks to be able to move primarily in shifty locations. I didn't have personal pain of extreme depth. And so many places in Europe are 300 meters, 500 meters, a thousand meters deep. And you imagine how painful it would be to drop a mark in that depth of water. So Jakob de Monaco is one of those places. And so they reached out early on because the way they'd been setting marks for a very long time was no fun. And so to have a high profile club like that be one of your first customers was big for us. And they pushed us really quickly to get better. It was a challenging process too, right? So we had to make the app French, right? And going through the cycles of internationalization and then also having contacts who didn't have English as a native language. And it all made us better and better along the way. Um, so I think that's who we would give credit to as the first club that really kicked us into gear. We had clients before that, but they went big. Not a single mark, but they wanted a whole fleet of them. This is something that doesn't exist until that point at which we made it. And so we have to explain what that means because everybody struggles to get their head around it. So fully autonomous race course suggests that there are no race committee people. There are no race committee boats. There is no gas being consumed. It is literally technology running the entire course. So from the start of the race, the bots go out of the club on their own. They go to the race course on their own. There is a bot on the right-hand side of the starting line called the signal bot. It has a horn system in it. 
And then there's a markset bot at the top of the course, which we call the weather bot, both in the weather position and also it reports the wind and the weather. And so with the combination of three bots, we're able to run an entire race course. Each boat has a tracker on it and the bots and trackers talk back and forth with each other. And so you're able to tell at the start of a race when somebody has crossed the line early. And when that happens, the horn on the signal bot goes off. People who have cell phones and smartwatches get notified there. And then there's a VHF auto broadcast that says who is over early. And so you imagine all the things that a race committee would normally be needed to do, we came up with ways to automate that. So further along the race, the wind shifts and the data is there from the weather bot to say, hey, the course is no longer square. And so then the course adjusts and becomes square. And it knows where everybody is on the race course because of the trackers on their boats. So it knows when it can make that change after the last boat has rounded it. All right, well, that's a fun question. So two different things. All of the bots are designed to be stable enough to stand in them. And people have ridden around in them when racing is postponed. People have got in them and taken pictures of boats rounding them. So it's kind of this fun thing where it, proving that a bot is so stable that even a full-size human can be on it. This year, 2020, has been an interesting year because of COVID. And so with most clubs in Europe not sailing, the U.S. became our biggest region this year. And that allowed us to get in front of regular clubs. So I think if I had to pick most successful things, it would actually be Chicago Corinthian and Crescent Sail Yacht Club, where we got at two clubs that in our minds would have thought this was too expensive of a solution. And the point is that it is now beneficial enough. The case has been made well enough that regular clubs, not the most elite clubs in the world, but also the regular clubs. And that was what we went into this planning to do. So it's very cool going to awesome clubs and hanging out with groups that make foiling f50s right that stuff's very cool but for this to be successful we wanted it to be for every club and that's what's happened this summer so pretty much every organization who has bought or rented marks from us this year because of covid has been a regular club that just sees the benefit of running races this way and we did that because this was a way to have less race committee and then going into our new product, Race OS, to have no race committee. So it was really around getting people out racing. And it worked. And uh, you know, you think of the successes of making a product when people directly benefit from something you made, that's the best part. And so when we saw these clubs around the country getting bots for the sole purpose of being able to have an actual race season this year that made it all worthwhile, right? All the hard effort came, came right at that point. And we said, this is fantastic, right? When you, when you are able to make a solution that helps people that uh, in this case would have just taken the year off.